Norse mythology tells the story of Jormungandr, a great serpent so long that it wraps itself the entire way around Midgard and bites its own tail. Legend says that when Jormungandr unclasps its jaws and starts to unfurl, it will signal the beginning of Ragnarok, the destruction of the world. And that was about as much information as the Foundation gave to Agent Nielsen when they assigned him to his watch duty in Greenland. In the frozen tundra all day, every day, he had been equipped with a sniper rifle, thermal goggles, and put up high in a watchtower. If he saw anyone, anyone, he had to shoot on sight, no questions asked. Whether it was his squad mates, the Brigadier General, or even his own mother, if anyone walked across the barren stretch of ice ahead of him, he was to shoot them dead. Under no circumstances was anyone allowed to enter that cave. The fate of the world could depend on it. But it was cold, and the days were long. For months he'd been sitting there by himself without seeing a single soul walk across the glacier. That's why it took him so long to spy the figure stumbling across the ice half a kilometer away. But the person didn't look any clearer when Agent Nielsen took a look through his thermal binoculars. Barely registering as much warmer than the snow around him, the man stumbled forward, seemingly unaware of the world around him. Could this be the start of the swan song of the world? Is this what he had been warned about? Without a moment's hesitation, Agent Nielsen snatched up the sniper rifle and readied his sights on the man. Somewhere buried deep beneath the Greenland ice is one of the most dangerous SCPs that the Foundation has ever come across. To say that SCP-722's reawakening could spell the destruction of human civilization is no idle concern. Classified as a Keter-level SCP, SCP-722 has been nicknamed Jormungandr, after the Norse myth. Researchers speculate that the creature's existence could in some way be linked to the early origins of the story of the Norse creature. 722 was brought to the Foundation's attention relatively recently. Environmental activist group Greenpeace was shooting a documentary on the effects of global warming on glaciers in Greenland. A small crew, including a director, producer, three camera operators, and a sound recordist, headed out to get some close-up footage from amongst the glaciers. Walking from ice sheet to ice sheet, they noticed several rounded entrances to what looked like deep ice caves. Surmising that these openings were only accessible to them because of the melting glacier ice, the crew climbed down into the caves to get some never-before-seen footage. Some of the footage of their exploration has been recovered since, and in the background of several shots as they are adjusting exposure and pulling focus, you can hear the producer and director theorizing about where these caves have come from. They initially seem to think that the caves are millennia old, preserved by sub-zero temperatures, but soon they come across several markings on the walls, ancient hieroglyphs and symbols. None of the crew were language experts, and so in the footage you can hear them struggling to identify which people group would have carved those into the ice walls. In the decades since, language experts from around the world have studied these markings on those walls, and have still been unable to identify any discernible links to any known human script. Most agree that it does seem to predate the settlement of the island by Eric the Red at the start of the 11th century. During this period, it is believed that there were no human settlements on the island, so the origins of this script remain unknown. As the footage goes on, you may start to notice something that the Greenpeace crew does not. One of the ice walls is no longer a wall at all. It looks like a rock in some of the footage, but whenever a flashlight shines on its surface, you can see a pattern to it. Scales. Then an opening at the far side of the tunnel, the crew emerges into an enormous cavern, estimated to be upwards of 200 meters in height and several times wider. Even their powerful flashlights struggle to cut through the darkness inside. That's the point that the sound recordist notices the scales running alongside them. As the camera pans, you see that they have been walking alongside a tail, several times taller than them. A tail that snakes its way through the darkness of the cavern to meet a hulking mass at the other side, shrouded in darkness. That is where the footage cuts off. Those Greenpeace filmmakers were next seen in a local town that evening. None of them had the chance to extol the wonders of what they'd encountered that day, as they were all sick. A couple went straight to bed in their lodgings, complaining of intense headaches and exhaustion. Others tried to check themselves into the ER, but never made it. Each of the crew died of different causes. Necrosis of the skin, internal bleeding, kidney failure. By 9 p.m. that day, all of them were dead. 
Fortunately, there just so happened to be a low-level Foundation agent staying in the same guest house as them who heard the commotion. Within two days, a perimeter was established. Within two years, the Foundation gained the bulk of knowledge of this SCP that they rely on to this day. It is unknown exactly how large SCP-722 actually is. A hulking serpent, half buried in ice, much of its body cannot be observed. It sleeps coiled up in the middle of the cavern that the filmmakers happened across. Some of its body is buried beneath fallen-in parts of the caves, others frozen into the ground around it. However, based on what can be observed of this SCP, it is estimated to be in the ranges of 8 to 12 kilometers from head to tail. Fortunately for just about everyone, including you, this SCP appears to be dormant. At no time since its discovery has this SCP been observed to move, make a sound, or otherwise indicate consciousness. Sensors are installed in the chamber to monitor its life functions and study its heart rate, temperature, brain activity, and more. One concern to the Foundation is that since its discovery, 722 has had a 0.9% uptick in neural activity. Researchers hope that this is just a natural part of the sleep cycle and that it will return to a deeper slumber soon. That is the hope, at least. So what makes this SCP so dangerous, then, if it's sound asleep? Well, let's go back to Agent Nielsen staring through the scope of his rifle. The barrel kicked back, a puff of warm smoke there and gone in cold air. He watched just long enough to confirm the kill before radioing back to command what he had observed. Within an hour, the cleanup crew arrived. Riding on snowmobiles, they waited at a distance for an hour before approaching the body. Rather unceremoniously, they wrapped it up in a black plastic bag, strapped it to the back of their snowmobile, and took it away for cremation. Nielsen just sat there in his watchtower the whole time, observing it all. The person looked sick, and not the kind of sick that you'd get from spending too much time out there on the ice. Their skin had gone rotten, like they had gangrene or leprosy. It wasn't just your usual frostbite. Most concerning, they'd been wearing a jumpsuit, standard issue for D-Class personnel. Only a vial held in their cold, dead fingers was any kind of clue for Nielsen as to what had been going on in that cave. But that was as close as the agent ever came to understanding the mysteries of SCP-722. The vial, however, was in many ways all he needed to know. That is because contained in that vial was a sample of the liquid secreted by 722. It is a liquid that the Greenpeace crew came into close contact with when they found the creature, and it's a liquid that promises and denies great power and great risk to the Foundation. Any and all attempts to study this liquid in any meaningful sense have failed. Anyone who comes into contact with it will immediately suffer acute sickness. Interestingly, however, there seems to be little consistency as to how this sickness manifests itself. Some develop a number of cancerous cells, whilst others lose cognitive function due to brain swelling. Symptoms seem to vary from person to person. Naturally, this makes studying the substance very difficult. Hazardous material suits have been deployed for researchers attempting to study it, but have all failed, despite being otherwise effective against chemical, biological, and radioactive threats. How the substance is able to infect them is unknown. Sadly, a good number of scientists had to die to make this discovery. Another route of study is to take the substance out of the cave and observe it under laboratory conditions. This was what Agent Nielsen observed as he shot and killed the D-Class personnel emerging from the cave. The D-Class had been sent in to retrieve the vial of the substance for external study. While a safe and direct route of entry and exit had been planned for the man to take, he became critically ill whilst in contact with 722 and developed an aggressive fever. No longer coherent over the radio, he dropped out of signal, wandering through the tunnels for two hours until emerging out of an exit high up on the glacier. Two agents with higher security clearance were dispatched to deal with the body. The reason for their wait was for their own safety. 722's toxin appears to denature with time away from its source, causing it to weaken in potency. If they had approached immediately, they may have well suffered similar fates to the D-Class. They survived, but the sample was ruined. All subsequent attempts have also been met with failure. It seems almost impossible to capture a clean sample and transport it any kind of distance. With this toxin, the Foundation would have possession of an immense biological weapon, akin to the discovery of the atom bomb. But as of right now, all it's good for is killing D-Class personnel. 
Initially, the Foundation believed the fluid to be a defense mechanism for the SCP, something to protect it in its deep sleep. But the more time is spent observing it, the more time this perception is shifting. SCP-722's toxin appears instead to be a weapon. As such, the containment of this creature is of paramount importance. There are eight known access points into the tunnel network that would grant access to SCP-722. Each of them has been sealed with reinforced gates with additional layers of soundproofing. At regular four-hour intervals, nitrogen gas cooled to a near-liquid state is to be pumped through these doors without fail. It is believed that the creature is a form of proto-reptile, and so is theoretically cold-blooded. Its internal temperature is dictated by its surroundings. Therefore, by keeping a cool average temperature in these caves, it is thought that this SCP's slumber can be prolonged. How long is unclear. With rising global temperatures year after year, the threat that the Greenpeace activists were proclaiming is very real, just perhaps not quite in the way they'd envisioned. Not only would there be an increase in natural disasters and a decrease in biodiversity, there would also be a 12-kilometer snake roaming around the planet, killing anyone in its path. Not ideal. As such, the Foundation has also planted a number of highly skilled individuals in prominent environmental positions in the hopes of turning the tide of global warming sooner. Should the ice in that cave system warm by even a couple of degrees, who knows what kind of spike they might see on the neural monitors. This SCP naturally is buried deep beneath layers and layers of security clearances too. Only in exceptional circumstances and for vital maintenance is anyone allowed to approach this SCP. A minimum of two Level 3 clearance agents are required to sign off on any such works. In recent years, a new Brigadier General took charge of the containment operations of SCP-722 after his predecessor was stripped of his duties. Overly zealous experiments and increasingly desperate attempts to harvest or synthesize the 722 toxin saw an alarming uptick in neural activity. Over 40 D-Class personnel were processed and disposed of within a two-week period in an attempt to assemble a micro-laboratory within the main chamber itself. This project failed, and the noises of construction threatened the peace that had so long been maintained beneath the glacier. The new Brigadier General is taking no such risks, enforcing a zero-tolerance policy on anyone approaching Site-103 unless suitably cleared. A number of hikers have sadly had to be killed this way but the Foundation believes it to be a necessary sacrifice to keep the peace. It is quite easy to find a convincing backstory for their untimely deaths and the lack of bodies to bury. Just another person to get lost and fall down a crack in the glacier, warning stories that are shared and planted in local towns and on the internet. The only threat to this current peace is a new avenue of inquiry that researchers have stumbled across, a link to a group of animals found halfway around the world. Monitor lizards of the genus Varanus seem to share a similar set of traits to SCP-722, namely the nature of their toxins. You may be familiar with the bite of a Komodo dragon. While the initial wound sure does hurt, the real damage comes in the following hours and days as necrosis sets in from the toxins in its mouth. Could these creatures share a common ancestor? Could 722 be the common ancestor? As of right now, it is just a hunch, but it's one that has taken root amongst the research staff. In order to find out more, though, they need samples, tissue samples, taken straight from the SCP itself. The only way to do back is to go back into the caves and start cutting. If a bit of construction noise was enough to raise brain activity by 0.9%, taking a hunk of flesh could prove a whole lot more dangerous, not least for the personnel involved, who will all have to sacrifice their lives. The potential benefits could be huge. A way to study fatal diseases in a new light, perhaps finding a way to reverse engineer cures to some of the deadliest conditions on the planet, or perhaps the missing ingredient to synthesizing the most powerful biological weapon in human history. Maybe worst of all, it could all trigger the reawakening. Do you remember how the story of Jormungandr ends? With a prediction that when the great serpent uncoils, the end of the world, Ragnarok itself, will arrive. But that's just an old fairy tale, right? Now go check out SCP-3000 and a Tashisha, and what is the biggest SCP?